Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this press conference from the 47th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum here in snowy Davos. Welcome here in the room. Um, I see there's more uh, gentlemen and ladies joining us. Welcome. Don't be shy. Take a seat. And welcome to everybody who's uh, joining us on the live stream to our global audience there. Welcome uh, to this press conference. We're joined here today and it's, uh, it's our great pleasure uh, for me to introduce to you the Vice President of Nigeria, Mr. Yemi Oshinbacho. Um, I've been told by colleagues from Nigeria that that's the way to pronounce the name. Apologies. I, uh, I hope I, I did it right. So um, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'll give the floor uh, to you, Mr. Vice President. Um, tell us about uh, Nigeria. Tell us about your expectations here uh, uh, at Davos and what your message is to the uh, assembled business and public sector and civil society leaders here in Davos, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much uh, for uh, coming to this. Um, let me just very quickly say that um, uh, everyone sort of knows that uh, the that Nigeria is, in GDP terms, possibly the largest um, economy in Africa, and also that uh, in the past three quarters, uh, Nigeria is, uh, has been in a recession, and uh, that. After that, that, that recession uh, continues, we uh, ec the economy contracted by about 1.8 percent in the last quarter of 2015. But uh, we've developed a robust economic recovery and growth plan, not just to take the country out of recession, but more importantly, uh, to set us on a path of sustained growth. That economic uh, recovery and gro growth plan is. Uh, very important to us because it's also an opportunity for us to address some of the structural problems that the economy has. Um, many would probably know that the largest source of uh, revenue for uh, the largest source of government revenue is uh, oil and also the largest foreign exchange earner. And that in the past year, uh, Aside from the drop in oil prices, we've had uh, disturbances in the Niger Delta, which has led to a sharp drop in production, especially in the, in the last year. And uh, the drop was so sharp that we're losing as much as 60% of uh, the revenues. But all of that uh, is certainly improving now. And uh, part of the economic recovery and growth plan is to address uh, the issues in the Niger Delta many of which we're coming to terms with already, and we're seeing production coming back up. And um, we're also looking at the opportunities that this offers for uh, diversification, given the fact that the Nigerian economy, as I pointed out, is um, almost a single source uh, foreign exchange earner and the largest revenue. In fact, oil is not just the largest revenue earner, but also uh, accounts for uh, practically 52% of non-oil revenues as well. I mean, it, it accounts for uh, about, yes, roughly about 52% of, of non-oil revenues as well. So it really is uh, crucial. But we're, looking at all, but we're looking at diversifying. We're looking at agriculture, uh, the whole agro allied value chain. We're looking at petrochemicals. Uh, we're also looking at manufacturing, which, uh, is uh, is quite critical as well as um, you know other sectors of, of the o other sectors that we think would be particularly important in in, in manufacturing for example uh, EPZs are very important and that's one of the key uh, ways by which we're trying to focus attention and focus our energies on on manufacturing and you know we, we think that that would uh, create uh, opportunities, to create opportunities both for local investment and foreign investment. I don't want to uh, go into a monologue. I was hoping that this would be interactive. So I think I'll probably just stop at this point and hope that you know, I'll get a few questions. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, and let's uh, follow that recommendation. We have a microphone in the room. So if I can see a show of hands who's interested to ask a question. Yes, the gentleman in the middle here. If you could state your name and uh, organization for the sake of our online audience, sure. please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Reuters News Agency, Dimitris Danikov. I'm here. 
Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, one, you've mentioned the oil production. Uh, yeah, uh, would it be possible to say where the current production stands at the moment and give us a bit of an update on talks with, uh, with uh, the militants and the Delta? And uh, we've seen lately new statements from Avengers, so uh, the oil markets are beginning to get concerned about this again. Uh, so where do you stand in, in talks uh, with... Uh, with uh, the militants and why there haven't been no meetings since uh, since Mr. President went there in early November. That's my first question. If I could uh, follow up with another one. Thank later, you very much. Just pass the microphone over to the gentleman here in the front, please. Hi, Omar Benyeda from African Business Magazine. Uh, there was talk that uh, Nigeria wanted to go and tap international capital markets. So I just wanted uh, an idea of timelines in terms of uh, or time frames in terms of when you're thinking of going, how much you're thinking of raising, and uh, where you're thinking of raising this capital. Thank you very much. Um, so um, we had a question on oil, and um, I'll leave it to you, which Thank you. order uh, you want to answer. Yes. Um, starting with oil production, we're close to about 1.7, 1.8, but we think that that could improve uh, uh, very quickly once we're able to uh, sort out all of the issues in the Niger Delta. Now, the militancy in the Niger Delta and uh, ongoing discussions, matter of fact, um, yesterday, just yesterday, I was in the Niger Delta. And um, that was possibly the first uh, direct engagement at the level of the presidency with, uh, the, with individuals there. So, uh, especially in the Delta area itself, I was in the Baramatu Kingdom, which is one of the uh, which is one of the areas where there has been uh, considerable unrest. Also in Wari, uh, where, of course, well, there, there are numerous facilities. Talking directly to uh, the youths and leaders in, 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 um, in the Delta region. So I think that we are actively engaged. Uh, of course, a lot of it cannot necessarily be publicized, but we're very actively engaged in negotiations. And we think that uh, we think that the engagement, especially uh, the uh, especially the fact that we're talking to all of the important groups, you know, uh, I'm sure that you might know that we had spoken earlier to uh, the Pan uh, the Pan Delta Forum. The Pan uh, Delta Forum is um, a forum of leaders and uh, youths and uh, civil society groups in the Niger Delta, including uh, the various ethnicities in the Niger Delta. And they are accredited by uh, practically all of, the, uh, all of the groups in the Niger Delta, and we've been speaking to them. They presented uh, a 16 uh, point, what, what they described as dialogue issues, and um, we think that is a sensible roadmap as to what to do and you know what steps to take to uh, to resolve many of the issues in in the delta. So we're very actively engaged uh, regarding the uh, uh, regarding the uh, euro bond. Yes, uh, I think that regarding the capital markets issue, of course, um, we are there's a euro bond uh, there's a euro bond offer which we're uh, which we're doing at the moment, and we think that we should conclude some at least by early February, by mid-February, is, is 1 billion US dollars. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there was a question from the gentleman in the back there. If you can get the microphone over there, please. Um, hi, my name is Tim Cohen. I'm from um, Business Day in Johannesburg. Uh, if you'd forgive a little bit of a colloquial question, um, I just wondered whether you had any uh, thoughts on why the relationship between South Africa, the diplomatic and business relationship between South Africa and Nigeria has, has declined so badly and uh, what can be done to fix it. I, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, some of the South African companies seem to have got into a lot of trouble in Nigeria um, and uh, the, um, the uh, um, I, you know, it seems to me a very disappointing for the two biggest economies on the continent to uh, to be at odds in this way. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. You want to? Yeah, I'll take, take the one directly. Okay. Um, first, I think um, when you look at the isolated uh, cases, 
it would seem that uh, the relationships between our countries, uh, South Africa and Nigeria, have gone uh, quite sour. But those are the some individual cases, and I'm sure that you probably have in mind MTN and and um, yeah, MTN in particular. But I don't think that that's the total picture. I don't think that that's representative of what is going on. There are several uh, South African companies uh, in Nigeria. The business environment in Nigeria especially allows for 100% ownership by investors. So that's, you know, that, that's very attractive for South African companies, and there's so many that, uh, that function in Nigeria. And, and I want to say that MTN you know, uh, was a violation of uh, a code of, of, of regulations that they also worked in developing. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't some arbitrary, um, some arbitrary um, imposition of a fine. They actually were participants in developing this in developing the regulations, and they were given sufficient time to even rectify their conduct or modify their conduct one way or the other. But as it turns out, uh, that was not done. And so this was really, and I don't think that MTN itself has complained about uh, the, has complained that they were treated unfairly. Of course, you know, it was a large fine, but that was even, even the fine itself is defined by law. You know, it's a daily fine and it's defined by law. So, the, so I, I think that there is a, and I think there is a clear uh, sense in which one would say that yes, sometimes a company, a foreign company, may run into trouble, especially a notable foreign company in an economy where, you know, obviously they're doing so well. But I don't think it's uh, any kind of hostility. I, I think that uh, the Nigerian government and business have embraced MTN. MTN has been in Nigeria now for close to almost 16 years or so odd. And uh, they've been doing very well indeed. And uh, I believe that they will continue to do very well. But I think that uh, if you take the isolated incidents, as I said, you may make that conclusion. But that's not the general story. That's not the general narrative. Thank you very much. Before we take more questions from the floor, I need to squeeze one in that came in through social media earlier. Um, uh, most of you might be aware that the forum has this young community of millennials, the, the global shapers, and they're very active in, in Nigeria as well. For example, a great hub in Abuja, and, and they're, they've, been, they've been begging me and said, can you ask our vice president to send us a message? Kind of, uh, so, th so what's, what do you think? I mean, the forum has only started the 47th annual meeting, but what would be your message to the young people in Nigeria uh, to take away from this uh, from this meeting and also from the theme of responsive and responsible leadership? Mm. I think that, um, you know, uh, people say about young people that they're leaders of tomorrow, but uh, I think that uh, it's very clear that they're leaders uh, of today because really the future has actually arrived. And um, so many of the young people that uh, I come across in Nigeria have shown uh, such tremendous versatility, such tremendous talent and energy. And with the digital age and with all of the advantages of today, they are clearly in the driver's seat in so many different respects. I mean, they control opinion on social media. They control the direction of technology with the innovations and all of those, uh, and, and all of the new things that are going on. And in many, in, in many senses, you know, they are defining entrepreneurship, defining governance. So I, so I think that um, the, 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 this, 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 this season belongs to them. This, this, this time belongs to the young. And I'm not so sure that they need anyone's permission to do the great things that they're doing. Certainly, they don't need the permission of any older generation to do the uh, incredible things they're doing. And all I want to say is that at least the government of Nigeria is solidly behind them, and um, we expect that uh, the, the coming years will see even greater achievement. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I think we had two more questions here, and I think after that we also have to close, but please let's take these two questions. The microphone is there. Sorry, sorry I just wanted to point out that the uh, euro bond is March, the, the expected uh, period is March 2017, March, not February, March. Sorry. Please go ahead. Mr. Vice, Pres Mr. Mr. Vice President, can I ask you what steps the government is planning to take to unify the exchange rates? Because we have such a big 
gap between the official and unofficial exchange rate, and that's uh, surely uh, really having a bad effect on your economy. Mm -hmm. When can if you, you expect? Excuse me, if you could also state your name and organization yeah. for the uh, sake I'm of Sujata the I'm Sujata Rao with Reuters. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much. Well, um, let me just say first that um, the central bank is responsible for uh, monetary policy generally. And uh, we have a structure that uh, allows the central bank uh, independence by legislation. But um, of course, this is a concern. The, um, the gap between the official and the parallel market is, 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 is a concern. And as we pointed out, it isn't, it isn't helpful. So we, if, uh, in, if you look at our economic recovery and growth plan, it is clearly the expectation that this will be redressed. And uh, this is a conversation that we're having with the central bank itself. And um, I believe that some, uh, uh, some adjustments need to be made that, and, and that, uh, a, that we must advance towards uh, uh, an exchange rate policy that, m that uh, closes that gap as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Thank you very much. S excuse me, can you use the microphone? Sorry, but is there any indication of when this might happen? Very soon, <laughs> I hope. Thank you very much. As I said, I'm not uh, in charge of monetary policy as a central bank, but the conversation is on, as I've said, and uh, there is a lot of, there's a lot of hope that we'll be able to resolve some of these issues as quickly as possible. So did we have one last question there in the middle? Has the question been answered? Well, the, the gentleman, please. Hi, good day, Mr. Vice President. Uh, Linda Svenzela from the African News Agency. You visited the Niger Delta yesterday, I believe. Eh? Yes. So in your engagement with communities, and I think you mentioned that this is probably the first time from a uh, presidential office uh, initiative that there's been that type of engagement. When you deal with communities that for as long as they can remember have, have um, stood on oil production as means of income and, and livelihood, what is the response or the reaction from them when you talk about new industries because oil is not going to be around forever and, and they need to start thinking about other alternative means of, of income and sustainability? So just from your initial interaction with them, mm -hmm. uh, how do you think it was perceived or received? Yes. Thank you. In fact, one of the, uh, I'm not so sure whether you are alluding to the fact that that was, an, that was a message that I actually took to the communities that um, we're not always going to have uh, the kind of um, value that oil has today. And that uh, in another how many years, I mean, some say 30 years, some say even, some are even saying much less, oil may be less valuable than it is today. And that we really need to be first, I mean, to them, is really more let's take advantage of the window that we have and um, that we cannot afford to continue uh, the kind of militancy that leads to lower production and time is running out. So I think that that message is one that resonates uh, with uh, the communities. Um, their response to it, you know, has been very positive. I think that all they're saying is, okay, let's engage, let's talk about this. There are issues around uh, justice, there are issues around resource control. They're, you know, they have their own issues. But I think it's a very sobering message, and um, the facts are all there for everyone to see. So they know it's not, this is not to frighten anyone or to push anyone to negotiations in any way. And I think it's, it's, it, it really does resonate with them. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for watching because it is time to close this press conference. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice President, for joining us here today and for answering uh, all the questions. Thank you for watching, and thank you for all for being here. Thank you very much.